I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. <clears throat> what about this issue of salvation? Um, I, I did a debate with an Imam, Imam Shamsi Ali in New York. In fact, I'll be doing another one in November in uh, New York, if you have any friends back that direction, on Jesus in the Bible and the Quran. Uh, we had a thousand people show up for that debate. We packed out the, the, the place we were in. And we had done a radio program together beforehand, and it was interesting because Shamsi Ali told the very same story I'm about to read to you, which I've used in almost all my seminars on what Muslims teach about the subject of forgiveness. Uh, but now I've got it in a specific written form so you can see it. But this story is told about four or five times just in, in Bukhari alone. And the story is told by Muhammad of a man, a Jewish man, who had killed 99 people. Mass murderer. Mass murderer. And uh, he came to a, uh, a monk and asked him if his repentance would be accepted. And the monk said no, and so he killed the monk, so now he's killed 100 people. <laughs> and so then he went to a scholar, and he asked the scholar, can my repentance be accepted? I don't know if the scholar knew about the monk or not, but he came up with a different answer. He said, go to such and such a city, and the people there are very righteous, and they will instruct you as to what you must do for your repentance to be accepted. So as the man is going, the time of his death comes. Remember, the time of your death, the very moment of your death, written on your forehead on, uh, before you're even born. And so he dies. And when you die, an angel from the hellfire and an angel from paradise come, and they argue over your soul. Now, I don't know about you, but the guy from hellfire should have had a fairly easy job on this one. All right? I mean, um, mass murderer, has not repented. Um, this one's easy. But the angel from paradise... Uh, sounds like an ACLU lawyer, and he says, but he was going to find out about repentance. And so Allah decrees that if he is one cubit closer to the city he was going to than the city he was coming from, he will go to paradise. And then he causes the earth to shrink between the man in that city until he's one cubit closer, and he is ushered into paradise. Now, I am not cherry-picking this story. I had told this story for years. And then I was doing a radio program with Imam Shamsi Ali, the imam of the largest mosque in New York City, with whom I was about to do a debate. And he told the story as an illustration of the mercy of Allah. So this is a well-known story. It's not something being taken out of context. You would think, if that's the case, that every good Muslim has got it made. I mean, if you say your prayers five times a day, you go on Hajj, you, you, you fast fastidiously during Ramadan, you should have your ticket punched and go into heaven. No. The problem is, Allah is about as arbitrary and unpredictable as Muhammad was. And there were companions of Muhammad himself who would break into tears at the thought of their death because they did not have assurance that they were going to come out of the hellfire. In fact, just for you ladies, I thought this one is repeated a number of times in the Hadith. I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers are women. <laughs> Not sure why that's there, but I just thought I would point that out to you. <laughs> Normally wakes people up a little bit toward the end of the presentation. <laughs> just a second. But um, the excuse, the reason is given, is not one that we would find overly compelling, because he was asked, why is that? And uh, the, the answer had to do with the fact that uh, women could not pray during their periods, and that their uh, testimony is worth only half of that of a man, to which... I think most Muslim women fought in their minds but did not speak with their mouths. Yeah, but those are your rules. Um, but that was the answer that was given at that point in time. And no person has any, even the Muslim who has said the Shahada, who has 
prayed the prayers, gone the Hajj, that person only has one way of knowing that they will have acceptance with Allah when they die. And the only way to know that, according to the Quran, is to die in jihad. That's the only way. Now, is it difficult to earn salvation in the Islamic understanding? I would say no. The Quran speaks about the scales being weighed. If one scale is heavy with good deeds as compared with the evil deeds, then one enters paradise. Is it easy to earn good deeds? Yes. In fact, Muslims think about the intention that we have to do a good. And there is a hadith related from the Prophet Muhammad that he said that if a person intends to do a good deed, it is immediately written for him in his records that he has done it. Or he, it, rather, to correct myself, it is written for him as a full good deed. And if he actually does it, then it's written for him as 10 times or even 700 times or somewhere in between. If on the other hand he intends to do an evil, it is not written for him, or against him rather, until he does it. And when he does it, it is written against him as one evil. But if, if, if in fact he turned away from that intention and he did not complete that evil act, then it is written for him as a full good deed. But if, if, if in fact he turned away from that intention and he did not complete that evil act, then it is written for him as a full good deed. So then salvation in Islam then, if we understand Islam properly, is in fact very easy and is open to anyone who would want to seek that salvation. Of course if somebody does not want to seek that salvation and he wishes to turn away, then this is something for which he will or she will have no, no one to blame uh, but uh, oneself. The Quran in fact speaks about salvation in some very general terms as requiring almost just simply in a nutshell belief in God. For example in Surah 41 in verse number 30 the Quran says inna ladhina qalu rabbuna allahu thumma astaqamu tatanazzilu alayhim al malaikatu alla takhafu wa la tahzanu As for those who say my lord is Allah alone the angels and they remain steadfast upon that then the angels would descend upon such person and say to them, you shall have no fear nor, grave com nor, nor grief coming upon you, but in fact have good news. But have good news of the paradise which has been prepared for you. So only belief in God is mentioned here. And being steadfast on that belief in God. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim which says that the Prophet Muhammad said that whoever dies knowing that there is no God but Allah will enter paradise. But Muslim scholars want to make sure that people do not get away with the wrong understanding, that we can just simply say, yeah, I believe and I have nothing to do and I'll be saved. So Muslim scholars emphasize those verses and in fact the Quran itself emphasizes that Muslims should not just simply say they believe, but they should follow up that belief with action. In fact, reason also dictates that our actions will flow out of our belief. And if we have a firm belief and a proper commitment with God, then the actions we perform will actually show whether our commitment and belief is with God. Why does all this matter? We close with this. June 30th, 2007. This is the Glasgow airport in Glasgow, Scotland. I have walked through it many times. Have you gone through that door, brother? Oh, I have too. The, the Starbucks is just down on the other side. Isn't it? You, know, you know where I'm talking about? I, I've stood there waiting more than once for Brother Handy's side. I've checked in at those gates uh, as the people are running away. The fire is from a Jeep that has driven into the airport and has exploded in flames. Thankfully, um, the folks who created the bomb were not really good at creating bombs, and the only people who died in the attack were the guys in the car. And they died of their burns later. That's a not a good way to go in any way, shape, or form.
But there you see the flames, you see the fire, and you think about two people who would pack a Jeep with all that gas and explosive devices and then hit the accelerator and head for that door, undoubtedly yelling Allahu Akbar as they then press the button to detonate the bomb, hoping that a huge fireball would go in and consume all those people. And you ask the question, why does someone do that? Why does someone do that? And the answer normally given is, oh, you know, they're down and outers, and they got nothing else to live for, and, and you know, they, they're being promised their 70 virgins, and things are so bad here, they might as well go do this. There's one little problem with that theory. The two men in the car, physicians, doctors, national health care doctors. Why would they do this? Well, because they were convinced that the only way that they could know that they had peace with Allah was to die in jihad. Now, I have Muslim friends who say what they did was not Islamic and it was wrong. And I wish an increase to their tribe because I do fly through the same airport. I wish an increase to their tribe. I understand their arguments. I could repeat their arguments. But the problem is, the line that divides the radicalized Muslim and the non-radicalized Muslim not, is not only a very small line that is very worrisome to me, but the problem is the debate between these two sides is based upon sources that I am absolutely convinced are not consistent or clear enough to answer the question. And that's the problem. I mean, I've listened to these guys. And you can choose your hadith, and they choose their hadith, and they square off against one another, and well, your hadith isn't sound, well, your hadith isn't sound, well, there's an error, your narration, blah, 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 blah. And the problem is, this massive body of collected memories is simply not clear enough to answer the question. I wish it was. We'd have a safer, more peaceful world if it was. But it's not. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Theology matters. What happens here, folks? You have a holy God. You have hellfire. You have sinners. Well, we have a holy God, we have hellfire, and we're sinners. What's the difference? We have a mediator. We have a mediator that they have been denied. We have the God-man. We have the one the only one, the unique one, where all the wrath and justice of God can meet all the love and mercy of God in the one unique place called the cross of Calvary. And they have been denied that. And there's the result. Theology matters. Theology matters. So, what about you? What are you going to do? What can you do? Well, first of all, you can pray that God will remove from your heart fear in proclaiming the message of the gospel to Muslims. Fear of the unfamiliar, fear of retribution. You can pray, God, remove the fear from my heart, make me a bold witness. And of course, you can do more preparation. Because my little hour and 15 minutes, I've introduced you to some of the major issues, but that's all of them. The areas of discussion between us, vitally important in all areas of apologetics. The transmission of the Bible, the accuracy of the transmission, the, the reliability of the text of Scripture, the doctrine of the Trinity, the atonement. All these things are things we deal with with every group. So your study in those areas is not just going to be about Islam. But there is a need to understand more about why Muslims believe the way they believe. And of course, as you have opportunity, then you pray that God's Spirit will use your words to bring light and life. Again, most of us have learned most of what we know from Fox News. That's not where we need to be. As Christians... I would think we would want to be able to look at our world and have some understanding, a biblical understanding, of why things are happening the way they are. I am quite concerned, my friends, that our governmental leaders do not understand Islam. They have a secular mindset, and they can understand why Muslims will do the things that Muslims will do. 
And I think we've already seen some of the results of that. One of the saddest things is, in every nation we've gone into, you know who suffered the most? The Christians. Christians, there were two million Christians in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. There are less than half a million now. They've been driven out. We wouldn't protect them. Hussein did. Every hymnal in every church in Baghdad was printed by Saddam Hussein. Why? Because he was a good guy? No. He knew how to keep peace, though. And unfortunately, that's not what's happening now. And that's happening in Syria. The Coptic Christians in Egypt are suffering. It's a mess. We need to pray. Remember Hebrews 13, 3. That we are to remember those who are in chains as if we were bound together with them. Sun dedemenoi. Bound together with them. They pray for us. We need to pray for them.